Thank you, Hillary, and the uh, Middle Eastern Initiative uh, for the opportunity to uh, moderate this event today. And it's my great pleasure to uh, uh, tell you a little bit about uh, Fatah Hassam, uh, who's a researcher, human rights consultant, and visiting fellow at the Issam Fetters Institute for Public Policy at uh, American University in Beirut and also at Lund University College Research Center in Sweden. Um, he was the regional uh, representative for the Middle East of the UN High Commissioner on Human Rights from 2006 until 2012. Prior to that, he was the Director of Forced Migration and Refugee Studies at the American University in Cairo from 2003 to 2006, and a Program Officer uh, at, for Human Rights at the Ford Foundation's offices both in Lagos and in Cairo. Uh, we figured out that uh, our paths probably crossed when he was the Director of Palestinian Human Rights uh, Organization uh, El-Haq from 1987 until 1995. Uh, I had uh, been part of a couple of Physicians for Human Rights de uh, delegations to uh, look at the West Bank and Gaza during that time. He's also one of the uh, uh, founders of the Arab Human Rights Fund and serves as uh, chairman of its board of directors, and he served on the board of several Palestinian, Arab, and international human rights organizations in addition to El Haq. He holds an LLM uh, in international human rights law from University of Essex, um, and his uh, uh, articles and studies have appeared in many, uh, many journals. My great pleasure to welcome him today. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Charlie and, and Hillary. Uh, very sincere thanks to the uh, Kennedy Center Middle East Initiative and the, and the CAR Human Rights Center for inviting me. It's, it's an honor for me to be here. But I want to begin with a little disclaimer first. I don't usually look like this. Uh, but I'm involved in a, in a theater production of Waiting for Godot in Maine, so it requires me to look unruly and, and uh, We thought you were so. wanting to join the Red Sox. It's right. very <laughs> vogue these days. Because the Red Sox? The Red Sox have beers. Not Al-Qaeda. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, what I hope to, to cover today in the talk, and, and please feel free to say, okay, that's enough talking now. Let's have a discussion any time that you feel I've gone on too long. But... Um, I've recently completed a study which was published by the Hassan Paris Institute in, uh, at the American University in Beirut on UN um, human rights mechanisms and the engagement of Arab states with those mechanisms. Now, when we talk about these mechanisms, we're talking basically about two types of mechanisms. One is the what we call the, the treaty system, the treaty, bo the treaty bodies, human rights treaties, each of which have committees that oversee their implementation states are supposed to submit reports and, and uh, then they get observations and comments on their human rights practices. Others also submit reports. And the other one is the charter-based system. Charter-based meaning it's according to the UN uh, charter uh, body and included in that is a human rights body called the Human Rights Council. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, the Human Rights Council was uh, revamped from the previous Human Rights Committee, uh, and uh, it is now uh, at, at a status pretty much equal to the Economic and Social Commission in, in, in the UN system, ECOSOC. So uh, the, the whole status of human rights has been raised up in the UN system to uh, a fundamental part of governance, development, and now human rights. Uh, within the Human Rights Council, in, as part of the change, they have created the Universal Periodic Review, which I will be talking about. So this talk will cover, essentially, and uh, oh, I forgot I have this. Ah. Um, I hope to talk about how Arab states have engaged with the treaty bodies and the special procedures, and what is the status of the ratification of these human rights instruments, and what kind of issues of concern were raised by what we call the treaty bodies, those committees, attached to the treaties uh, to, you know, in their observations and recommendations in response to these state reports. Then we go on to the uh, Universal Periodic Review as part of the Human Rights Council, as I mentioned, and I will look at the issues of concern, the human rights issues of concern raised by NGOs and by states in the interactive discussions and in the reports. I'll explain a bit more detail on that later and then also discuss a little bit the recommendations that were made in, in, for each state in, in its uh, periodic review and what which they, accept, what they accepted and what they rejected. 
by you know, by necessity, because of the time, this would have to be a very broad overview. I cannot get into much detail on each of the countries, uh, you know. So hopefully, this will just give you kind of a broad, a broad picture. Now, just a word on on methodology uh, for the treaty bodies and for the UPR. I didn't do all of the countries; it was not possible. For the treaty bodies, it's difficult because they have such varied uh, ratification, which we'll talk about a little bit. Uh, but also, you know, just the volume of material is much. So I chose a representative sample of ten countries, which covered the region in terms of type of governance system, population, uh, you know, Middle East. Uh, North Africa, Gulf, etc. And similarly with the UPR, they're not necessarily they're not the same ten countries for the UPR review as I did for the treaty body review. Just to be just to be aware of that. Um, for the treaty bodies, I read all of the comments and observations and recommendations made to the state by the treaty bodies, and the analysis is based on that. Whereas for the UPR, I read through all of the stakeholder reports, the working group report the recommendations and the interactive discussions uh, that, that took place uh, in that in that UPR. So for each, I will go through a kind of a comparative analysis uh, of issues of concern, all right? So, shall we start? Oops, too excited. <laughs> First, a quick look at the ratification status. I chose only the nine, what we call the nine core human rights treaties. There's many more that get into a bit more detail and all of that. And an interesting picture emerges, which sometimes may actually contradict some impressions people have in terms of the Arab region and human rights. In fact, most of the Arab countries are indeed party to most of the human rights treaties. You know, so they have these, these, these legal obligations under those treaties to implement the provisions of those treaties. Sudan, Somalia, and the Comoros Islands, and here we're talking about states that are members of the Arab League. These three are members of the Arab League. There are 22 states. Palestine is not included because it, it is not, uh, that's only recently been recognized as a state non-member of the United Nations, so now it is, has the possibility to sign and ratify the treaties. So <coughs> that brings the number down to, to 21. There are three states that are you know, not so interested or excited about signing treaties, and that's Sudan, Somalia, and the Comoros Islands. So if you take those out, then you're seeing, in fact, almost universal acceptance of human rights treaties. I should add that of the 21 states, in addition to Comoros, it is four countries of the Gulf Cooperation Council that are not members of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights or the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. So that's why you have the number 16. Interestingly, the Convention on the Rights of the Child is almost universal, except for Somalia. Has the US signed it yet or not yet? Right. Um, and these are basically the only two states in the world, I think, that have not yet signed on to the Child Rights Convention. Interestingly, also, if you look at the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, 19 of the 21 states are parties to that, including most of the countries of the Gulf, are committed to CEDAW. Okay, that's an interesting tidbit to know. The Convention on Enforced Disappearances which has only three, is of course the newest convention. It just came into force I think in December, 23 December 2010. So not very many states in the world have yet really signed on to that. Uh, we may see more ratifications of the enforced disappearances convention, but I'm not really sure uh, you know, how many Arab states will sign on to that. That begins to touch on civil and political rights. We will see. The main problematic convention that's been enforced for a while, problematic I think only because the issue is problematic, is the Convention on Migrant Workers and Members of Their Families. As you know, most of the Gulf states and many of the states in the region, not only the Gulf, are host to significant numbers of migrant workers. 
including especially migrant domestic workers. And we'll be talking a bit more about that later on in the talk. So they have been less willing to uh, sign on to and commit themselves legally to how they're going to be treating the foreign workers working in their in the country. So that's been, I think that I see that as one of the main, if not the only, um, problematic dimension. Now, of course, ratifying and being you know, obligated under the treaty is one thing, but then you have to see how you're going to implement. It's a much bigger study and much more involved to look at the first requirement of being a party to these treaties, which is to harmonize your national legislation with the treaty commitments. That I'm not going to be talking about, because that's just too complex uh, an issue right now. And I think that would require individual state research <coughs> when they look at that. But I can talk a little bit about the other requirement, which is that each state has to periodically report to the treaty body on how it's implementing the convention. And in that, the record of the Arab states is a little bit bad. <coughs> Over half of the states are seriously late in presenting the reports, some as many as 13 years or more. So there's much less interest <coughs> in actually continuing beyond this uh, declaration that I have signed this treaty and actually have a dialogue with the international community in the form of uh, the treaty body uh, on how I'm implementing that, that convention. For the Civil and Political Rights Convention, for example, 10 states are late, two of them by one or two years, the rest for at least five years or more. Interestingly, now the Arab states are <coughs> the most diligent about reporting on the Child Rights Convention and on the Women's Convention. Almost all of them are pretty much up to date on these two conventions in particular. Now, for the rest of the countries, maybe about six countries are about one or two years late in reporting, which is actually not out of the ordinary. This is very consistent with the global record. Most states tend to be about one or two or three years late. Eventually, it does come through. Uh, I know our, my former colleagues in Geneva with the Office of High Commissioner who administered this whole process for the treaty bodies, you know, just are always churning out reminder letters to the country, you're late, you're late, you're late, you have to submit your report, but, you know, that's how it is. Now, the other thing that I should mention about this is the optional protocol. And I'll tell you why it's significant. The optional protocols are additional protocols to specific treatments. And usually they involve an acceptance by the state of the possibility of individual complaints. That individual can, individuals can send a complaint to the treaty body. And the treaty body then has, is authorized to communicate with the state about what happens in this particular case. You know, can you give us information about why this person was detained arbitrarily, blah, 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 blah. This is the information we got. So the, the correspondence ensues on that. States are much less willing to commit themselves to these optional protocols. The only five states have accepted the individual complaints procedure under the Civil and Political Rights Convention. Four under the Convention Against Tortures Article 22, which deals with individual complaints. But the optional protocol to CAT, which includes commitment to uh, establish a national prevention mechanism for torture and to accept the authority of the jurisdiction or the communication with the International Subcommittee on the Prevention of Torture under OFCAT, established under OFCAT, only three states have done so. Tunisia, just after the revolution. Lebanon, I think about in 2009, 2008. And they still have not established a national prevention mechanism. And they still have a hard time accepting the communication with the subcommittee on the prevention of torture, although it did come to visit in Belgium. This would indicate to me that it's one thing to say, okay, I am a, you know, a party to this treaty, I commit myself to these human rights principles of the Women's Convention, the Child Rights Convention, etc. but I'm much less willing to subject myself to international scrutiny on how I'm doing that. 
So there is, that's the beginning uh, sense of, of that gap. The other side of the human rights mechanism system are what we call the special procedures. What we mean by special procedures are individual experts, usually <coughs> individuals, appointed either by the Human Rights Council or sometimes by the Secretary General of the United Nations on particular geographic or thematic mandates. So you have, for example, the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in the Occupied Territories. You have the Special Rapporteur on Torture. You have the Special Rapporteur on, or the Independent Expert on Summary Execution. You have a working group of experts on arbitrary detention. So these are all you know, individuals. Now their mandate is to communicate with the state. They can receive complaints. They, have, they basically dialogue with the state with the idea is that this is an international cooperative effort to help the state improve its human rights record. Now states, however, often see it as these rapporteurs actually present the report to the Human Rights Council periodically. This is what I did, these are the countries I visited, these are the recommendations I made, these are the complaints I, I received, etc. Here again, states are not very willing to accept um, communications or visits. I'll give you just a couple of examples. There's only Bahrain and Morocco that seem to really care about responding fairly quickly to communications from these mandate holders. So they get a, com they get a com communication, for example, saying, I have received information that so and so and so and so was detained in you know, in such circumstance, can you give us any information? Then the state is supposed to reply with its, yes, this is true, no, this is not true, uh, yes, this is true, but this is not a human rights issue, uh, you know, whatever the replies are. Just the act of replying, there's only two states that seem to be consistently interested in responding. You can see the difference between, you know, in 2011, Syria, 15 communications received, they responded to only three. Egypt, similarly, 13 responded to five. Libya, seven responded to zero. This was before the revolution, okay? And so on. This also gives you an idea of kind of, a, you know, it helps us kind of get a sense of where the Arab states are, what their perspective is. Uh, now, if the fact that they respond doesn't necessarily mean that it's a good response, right? I mean. Bahrain has, is very good at responding, but I've seen all of the responses, and all of those responses, frankly, are, you know, this is not true. No, this did not happen. No, you don't understand, this is protected by our law. Whichever answer is, it doesn't necessarily mean that they agree or change any of the practices because of these communities. Okay, let's look a little bit at uh, Oh, I should only I should add here that you can usually the special rapporteur or the mandate holder writes and asks for permission to visit the country, and then it's an official visit, and they meet with government people and they meet with civil society and they meet with, with you know victims of the particular issue that they're dealing with, etc. But there's also there all states are encouraged very strongly by the Human Rights Council every time in every meeting to issue open invitations, meaning. We have an open invitation. All you have to do is tell us when you want to come and you're welcome to come. Only five states in the region have actually issued such open invitations. And they're Jordan, Kuwait, Lebanon, Qatar, and Tunisia. Sometimes there are problems. Yes, of course, open invitation, but you know, the next month is not a good time. We're going to be doing this and doing that. Can we postpone it to next year? Then next year it will be a similar story. So again, that doesn't always necessarily mean that the visit will take place. But it is telling that only five countries have issued open invitations. Um, let's go on to the observations and conclusions of the treaty bodies and the special procedures. And here, uh, just for explanatory purposes, these are the countries that have covered in, in, this, uh, in this section of the study. And what I've looked at are the observations of, I didn't look at all of the committees, of course. Again, to remind you, 
not all countries are parties or treaties, etc. So I looked at the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, Committee on the Rights of the Child, Women's Committee, Migrant Workers Committee, there's one, one party, state party, and the Special Rapporteurs or Independent Experts, mandate holders on trafficking, on health, on housing, food, summary executions, human rights defenders, independence of judges and lawyers. So what we're, the issues we'll be talking about will be kind of a sum total of what everybody has said. And these are the human rights issues that I looked at, again, to try and limit the study to make it somewhat manageable. Right? The right to work, labor rights, adequate standard of living, right to health, right to education, and the three, in my view, and that's what I was interested in, the essential political and civil rights that have to do with civil society participation. For me, I try to focus on those. Now, here are the common themes that come across all of the observations and conclusions. And they are basically that you've got serious problems across all of these human rights issues, whether you're talking about health or education or labor, with gender equality, with discrimination against women, with women's rights generally, violence against women, girl education, reproductive rights, etc. In all, almost all of the treaty body comments and observations, the issue of equality between men and women always came up, always came up, was brought up. The second one is the issue of the rights of non-citizens and their situation. Non-citizens here, and I, I prefer to use that term, because you can include uh, refugees, and there are, especially now, as you can imagine, there have always been refugees, there are Palestinian refugees. Many of the comments on Lebanon, for example, had to do with their treatment of Palestinian refugees. The, uh, you've got Iraqi refugees still all over the region. You've got now, of course, the Syrian refugees, but probably they were not much included in these, as these were up to 2012, or including 2012. Right? So it was only, was still very new. Um, but you also talk about migrant workers. You're also talking about migrant domestic workers. They figured very much across, and they came up in the comments of CEDO, the, the Women's Committee, and the comments of the Economic and Social Rights Committee in that most, if not all, most 90 plus percent of migrant domestic workers are women. So they get looked at from a women's rights perspective as well as from a labor rights perspective. And also, what's included under non-citizens are stateless persons. There's, you know, I don't know what the exact number is, but you're talking about not including the Palestinian refugees who are also stateless, except for in Jordan where they did get citizenship. Uh, you're talking about hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of stateless persons. The Bidoon in Kuwait, also in Qatar, you're talking about in Saudi Arabia. Even Lebanon has something like 30,000 stateless persons. That's a complicated, long story. So what happens to you as a stateless person if you don't have legal personality in the country? You cannot get married and have your marriage recognized by the state because you don't exist. You cannot have your child go to a government school because, you know, to be registered, you have to have a family uh, legal number, etc. So you get all kinds of complications in terms of these individuals and families exercising their fundamental human rights because they don't have citizenship anywhere. The other issue that came up was, of course, with regard to children, problems of child labor, problems of child health, children's health, and education, and literacy. There was a bit of variety in the literacy. The, the committees noted some good progress over the last number of years in combating illiteracy, but still very serious problems, particularly for girls in countries like Yemen, to a degree Syria, and Egypt, for example. So you had the uh, And finally, the other thing that came up across all of the thematic I mean, the thematic uh, mandate holders as well as the committees, is a real serious urban-rural divide in terms of enjoyment of rights. Whether you're talking about economic development, unequal development between the cities and the countryside, whether you're talking about education, varied 
statistics of education in the countryside versus the city, uh, etc. That includes inequality of services and, and what and everything else that follows basically from that. Um, where am I here? Okay. Moving on to freedom of expression and freedom of association. And this, and in my view at least, I mean, this really affects everything else. It affects how civil society participates in discussions and debates of public policy, in presenting ideas on improving educational quality, for example, or improving the quality of health, or providing services in terms of health. Any, anything, you know, the, the expectation that it's only the government's responsibility and you're not supposed to be doing anything with it is seriously problematic. Evidenced by, in terms of freedom of expression, laws are very vaguely worded. There are, there's criminalization under things like it's illegal to encourage hatred. Well, what does encourage hatred? Some, in, some, in one of them, for example, I remember really encourage hatred of the state. So if I criticize the state, am I encouraging hatred of the state? Who's going to interpret that? The judge or the prosecutor who takes you before the court. And if the prosecutor makes a political decision to take you before the court on a charge like that, you can be sure that the judge is going to be politically pressured not to throw it out, out of court. So these kinds of issues. Tarnishing the image of the state. If a human rights organization publishes a report on torture, that's tarnishing the image of the state. Uh, encourage, uh, insulting public officials. If I say, you know, this man is corrupt, you know, and I have proof. It doesn't matter if I have proof or not. I have insulted him. That's criminalized under much of the laws. There's censorship, regular blocking of internet sites, comes and goes. Depends on the country, depends on the issue, depends on the time period. It could be relaxed for a while and people begin to write and feel good about it and then suddenly, bam, the ax comes down and lots of blocks are shut down and sites are blocked off. And what the, what the end result is, of course, well known, regular arrests of journalists, bloggers, human rights defenders, democracy activists, and what have you. On freedom of association, very closely related, of course, the NGO laws are extremely restrictive where NGOs are even allowed. In countries like Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Oman, and until, I mean, until now, up there, you know, except in the liberated areas of Syria. Syria as well, NGOs were just simply not allowed. You just cannot go and establish a non-governmental organization. And if you are allowed, if there is a law of association, chances are it's extremely restrictive, meaning you need pre-approval for almost everything, especially if you're going to get funding from the outside. Many people do. Many of these have become, in some ways, blue laws, as it were, so that people ignore them and they do it anyway, until the government decides this is the problem. This was the case in Egypt for many years. It was illegal to get foreign funding without permission. But the government ignored it for many years, until it doesn't like that particular NGO, then it can drag it into court saying, why didn't you get permission for this funding? And that's what they've done in a number of occasions. In some cases, approval of the board has to be from the government. We have to approve who's on your board. So, we, and it gets even more, much more, much more detailed. Joining international bodies, etc., and that includes labor unions. This is part of the reason why, until very recently, almost all of the labor federations in the, in the country were entirely controlled by government, and they were run by people who are either allied to the ruling party or the ruling family or, or what have you. <coughs> there was a strong movement growing in the last eight, seven, eight years for independent unions, to establish independent unions, free of government control. It was a big struggle in Egypt, it was a big struggle in Jordan. In Jordan, they have succeeded in establishing a number of independent unions, but they're still not legally recognized by the government. But they are there, and they're negotiating, and they're you know, getting into arbitration with their employers, etc. In Egypt, they were beginning to succeed and when the revolution happened, 
they were able to establish a federation of independent trade unions, and they got within the first year two and a half million members. Um, okay, I think that's enough on that. I'm trying to also keep rolling here so that we don't, I don't talk too much. Let's talk a little bit about the Human Rights Council's Universal Periodic Review. Now, as I had mentioned, it's a new mechanism. It was only established in 2008, which means it's only been working now for five years, six years, right? So the first cycle took four years. And what I mean by cycle, I mean the idea that all countries, members of the United Nations, have to go through this universal periodic review whether or not they've signed any human rights treaties. That's what's unique and different and new about this, this process. Secondly, it deals with all rights. It's not a question, it's not a political rights issue or, a, or, a, or a, you know, economic rights uh, focus. It is all human rights as enumerated in the international treaties and everybody can be involved. That's another very interesting difference. And in the past, like with the treaty bodies, you could not submit a, 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 a information, for example, to a treaty body, unless you had consultative status with the Economic and Social Commission, or the Economic and Social Council, as it's called, right? Under the Universal Periodic Review, anybody can submit information related to the state and its practices that is going to be going through the review. The UN then takes all of that information and compiles it in a document called a stakeholder's report. Okay. So that's this, the, this, uh, right. So when the review happens, the review is based on three main documents. The state presents its, its report to the universal review, to the review. The stakeholder summary prepared by the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights is the second document. And also prepared by the Office of the High Commissioner is the compilation of UN observations, recommendations, special rapporteurs, suggestions, and reports, etc., that I had just been talking about. All of these as well are compiled and presented as part of the review. Then there is an interactive discussion and dialogue within the Human Rights Council acting as a working group for the periodic review. And a number of recommendations are made by states, specific states, right? These recommendations then are either accepted or rejected by the state. Now the following cycle is supposed to be, the second cycle and subsequent cycles are supposed to be, let's look at those recommendations that were made that you accepted and see how much was implemented in this period of time, right? And that's what we're looking at right now in this second cycle. Um, it happens every four years for all states. So it become actually, it surprised everybody, I think, what an extensive process it was and what a thorough process it was. Now certainly, it is a political process as well. The Human Rights Council members are representatives of states. So undoubtedly, they're not going to go far beyond the policy line of the state they represent. So the previous Human Rights Commission that was roundly criticized for over-politicization, and the reason for which the shift was done and the Human Rights Council was created, the Human Rights Council has also received a number of these criticisms of politicization. But I think the surprise for everyone, including me, is that in fact, despite the politicization, it has actually become uh, quite an important process in the, in the human rights uh, mechanism. So let's go on a little bit to look at concerns. Nice graph, huh? Mm -hmm. Now what I've done is I've disaggregated. This is, what I, this is how I've looked at it, right? I've looked at the number of times a particular issue was raised and did a numbers comparison. Now I know numbers are not an exact science, particularly in this kind of, you know, actually this is quite the opposite. Everybody's telling you now to do everything measurable. Everybody wants numbers now. I'm never convinced about numbers, but at least for this one, to try and get a sense of it, this is what I did. 
I looked at the number of times an issue was raised vis-a-vis -vis the total number of issues raised by each, by non-Arab states and by Arab states separately, by international NGOs and by national and regional NGOs, in other words, NGOs from the Arab region. Okay. And I began to look at, you know, the idea is that, you know, okay, if I raise women's rights very frequently, then women's rights is an issue of concern for me. And I keep saying it. Right? And here I'm talking about the, the, the review of 10 of the Arab states again, right? So then what do we find from this? Interestingly, civil and political rights was the issue raised most frequently by international NGOs. It was also raised quite a lot by national regional NGOs, but not quite as much as international NGOs. Right? Whereas economic, social, and cultural rights, it's reversed. Even though it's a bit less vis-a-vis -vis the overall number of recommendations, is still national and regional NGOs were much more concerned about economic and social rights than in those 10 countries than international NGOs were. This is an interesting uh, you know, statistic. Now within civil and political rights, freedoms of opinion and conscience, freedom of expression, association and assembly top the list of issues. Now in the study I did, I get into much more detail about each of these categories to look at them. So I just thought I'd mention that here without really going into a you know, more thorough discussion. Yeah. The protection of migrants and minorities overall did not receive a huge amount of, in terms vis-a-vis -vis the total number of, of concern, but again, the national and regional NGOs paid a lot more attention to it than the international NGOs did, or at least somewhat more attention to it than the international NGOs did. And the other interesting thing is that, uh, where is that? Right. What was I going to say about that? Now they raised this, and this is you know in terms of uh, in the context of, of uh, the, the state's counterterrorism efforts, right? But it did not receive as much interest as the ongoing systematic problems that are structural in terms of human rights protection uh, in those countries. Now the last thing I would say, interestingly, that states included concern about women's rights much more frequently than NGOs did. And interestingly, Arab states expressed that concern about women's rights and equality of women at the same frequency in terms of the total number of recommendations made as non-Arab states did. Right? Which, you know, again, it challenges some of the assumptions that we have. One would assume that you know, it's the European countries and the rest of the world that would come out and say, you have to protect women. And in fact, Arab states told themselves that, that's the same as well, as frequently and as, as uh, you know, strongly, let's say, as, as the non-Arab states did. Um, now, in the state's recommendations, if we look at that a little bit, economic and social rights, the Arab states express much more concern about that than the non-Arab states did. This is talking about concern in the recommendations and in the, in the interactive discussion. That's a very similar pattern to the, the uh, sorry, the NGOs as well. So it seems that the Arab states and the Arab NGOs, you know, also prioritize economic and social rights quite a bit more than the international NGOs and the non-Arab states did. In the area of civil and political rights, non-Arab states made recommendations almost four times more frequently than Arab states did. Right there. 
So Arab states in the recommendations to each other kind of stayed away a little bit from civil and political rights. Yeah. A couple of more notes on this is that states legislative framework which is what I, what I call institutional protection of rights in the law and the institutions of the state, etc. cetera. Um, it, that came in as important for states and for Arab states even more than international NGOs. Now that's an interesting question. Arab states seem to favor councils, national human rights institutions. Most Arab countries now have national human rights institutions. How well they function, how well they apply the Paris principles and how these are supposed to work is another discussion. But, uh, they do have them, and they talk to each other a lot in the Universal Periodic Review about, well, you know, you should uh, really establish or strengthen your national human rights institution. You should, you know, so they like the idea of creating structures and, and uh, systems for protecting rights. Again, implementation can be a different question. Um, they also there was a lot on human rights education. They encouraged states to undertake human rights education uh, capacity building programs of what have you. They accounted for about 10% of all the times issues were raised by Arab states. Twice as much and twice as often as non-Arab states raised the issue of capacity building and human rights education. Okay, so let's move a little bit more. Start looking at the acceptance and rejection of recommendation. Now, altogether, something like 871 recommendations were made to the 10 states in the review, the 10 states that I consider in this study. Okay. And the trend of the those 10, 10 states to accept or reject recommendations did not differ markedly from the global trends. So there wasn't anything especially bad. They did not reject any more than everybody else did. They did not accept any more than everybody else did. They were pretty much consistent with, with the... Uh, now, the total doesn't necessarily add up to 100. That's only because there's about 12% of the recommendations that were we're going to look at it into it and get back to you later. This is going to be reviewed at another point. Um, or, you know, they gave a very general response, but no, no clear I accept or I reject kind of answer. So, but these were the clearer I accept or I reject this. Uh, now, okay, one thing to look at, accepting, rejecting, but what kind of recommendations were they? That would be an important question to ask, right? So in that, in thinking about, of course, that was really problematic in trying to read the recommendation, trying to say okay, what kind of typology of recommendations can you put together. And here I relied on uh, a, an initial study, probably the first one, called the Universal Periodic Review of Work in Progress by uh, Edward McMahon, who teaches at the University of Vermont, I think. Uh, and he had done this typology. Instead of inventing my own, and you know, I have to, I could do things in differently with this, but I decided no, in order to have international discussion on these issues a bit more consistent, let's just stay with the same typology and see, you know, might help us do comparison better. He had five categories of, of recommendations. What kinds of recommendations? Category one was very, very general. Oh, you're doing great. Share your experience, please. Why don't you call on the Office of High Commissioner to help you do that, too, and, you know, cooperate. But nothing really in the way of a recommendation as such, other than share your experience. Can I learn from you, please? It's so wonderful. The second category is, you're doing great. Keep doing this. This is very good. Proceed, please. Do, you know, the third category is, well, why don't you think about doing something along those lines, right? Or consider taking an action. Why don't you review some of what you're doing? Perhaps it can be done. So in other words, it's still a very timid recommendation, but it is beginning to go in the direction of 
you know, a, a concrete idea of sorts. The fourth one is take measures without saying what measures there are. You know, take steps towards one, two, three without saying what steps need to be taken. And finally, in the fifth category, you know, amend this legislation so that you can stop this discrimination. Uh, stop doing one, two, three. Ratify a treaty. It's a very specific action. It's a very specific recommendation. So it gets a little bit fuzzy here, and I must apologize in advance, but it's because there is a lot of overlap in them. And there's a, a level of subjectivity in choosing which recommendation actually fits this or fits that or fits, you know. But we do the best we can, yeah? Um, let's look at the recommendations now. Remember, here it's actually in reverse order. One is the very general, and five is the most specific. <coughs> if you look at this, other is the non-Arab. But I chose to put other because it fits better in that one. Otherwise, we should. Um, you're doing well. Keep going. Continue current actions. Arab states that constituted fifty percent of all the recommendations by Arab states to the ten Arab states, right? But it's also high for the non-Arab states up to 30% almost. So that's where most of the recommendations went. By contrast, only 5.4% of the recommendations called on the reviewed state to take any specific action. Only 5%, just a little over 5%. In category, f that's, I'm sorry, I was, should have been pointing to that one. That's what I meant, right? The recommendations to take specific actions by non-Arab states were more than four times as, as much. These are very general, generally framed, right? Very general, either continue, share your experiences, think about doing something, why don't you, etc. If we combine these together, they represent 75% of all Arab states' recommendations. So 75% of Arab states' recommendations saying, oh, you know, keep it general, good work, we're with you, let's help each other out here kind of uh, uh, approach. Rejections are in red. Um, Remember the five, the very specific recommendations? 50, what was it? Right, 57% of all recommendations made, rejected, were in category five. So in other words, don't tell us what to do. Anything specific, don't tell us what to do. We're going to do it in our own way. We're going to do it how we want to do it. Um, again, even category three, where you're not being asked to, to do, but only to consider taking an action, they still were very hesitant. Now here's the other thing you notice. Not one recommendation by another Arab state was rejected. That's part of the political quid pro quo game that states play. So in other words, None of the recommendations made by Arab states to the 10 states under review were rejected by those states. And that's part of the reason for that is that more than 75% of those recommendations were non-committal anyway. So okay, fine. I can accept that, I'll consider. A couple of words on the type of recommendation. Of all of the rejected recommendations, almost 30%, more than 27% of the rejected recommendations were on the death penalty, were on you know, eliminating the death penalty in the law. 
um, 14 and a half percent had to do with ratifying conventions and optional protocols. We're going to ratify whatever we want to ratify. You're not going to tell us what. I mean, this is 13, 14 and a half percent of the total recommendations rejected. Okay, not of the total recommendations, but of those rejected. Uh, similarly, on migrants and refugees, 12.7 percent. Interestingly, half of the rejected recommendations were rejected by Lebanon on the treatment of Palestinian refugees. Many states dealt with how Lebanon was treating or not treating well Palestinian refugees in Lebanon, and Lebanon rejected all of those uh, recommendations. Uh, on women's rights, about 10% were rejected, usually in the specific category. You know, you should do one, two, three. No, we shouldn't do anything. We'll do what we want. Four percent, four point two percent of the total recommendations rejected were on sexual orientation. There were a number of recommendations by states, particularly in Europe, as you expect, uh, that you know talked about stopping discrimination against people on the basis of sexual orientation. These were all rejected, you know, out of hand. And just a few, maybe about three and a half percent on labor rights issues. The bulk of rejections on women's rights issues have to do with questions of family or personal status law, especially on granting women the right to give nationality to their children. This is a huge debate in the Middle East and North Africa and the Gulf. Huge debate. You still have, you know, you sanguini when it comes to, you know, the, the development of citizenship, being born in the land is not the issue. Being born to a father who is a citizen is the way uh, citizenship transfers. And women's rights organizations have been fighting about this for decades now. And they, they had some gains. They had a partial gain in, in, uh, in Egypt about five, six years, said no, seven, eight years ago maybe. Uh, they've had some gains in Morocco and in Tunisia. Okay. So, um, I think I'm going to wind down and come to a stop. Uh, I probably won't try and come up with some, you know, magnificent commentary and conclusions. I think I'm just kind of presenting, you know, the findings of what I've looked at. Some interesting observations can be made. Clearly, the idea that, you know, Arab states are engaged, but not not engaged. We're no longer hearing about we have nothing to do with this human rights. We have Islam. We don't need anything else, kind of thing. Or rarely do we hear it now. We used to hear it a lot in the early 90s. Now it's no, no, Islam, human rights, and Islam are consistent. Human rights are covered in Sharia, and you know there may be some points of contention, but these would be worked out according to our interpretation of human rights, but not a rejection out of hand of the human rights system. They are engaged in the UN, they do their reports back and forth, late, fine, but they are engaged and they are willing to do more. I think we've made big inroads in the last 25 years. When I remember when I started working in the human rights thing, we just couldn't really even bring up the issue of human rights. The UN development program, when they were working on the UN country development document in Egypt some years ago, they presented the first draft. This was supposed to have been done in cooperation with ministries and you know all of this stuff has properly should be done. When it came to the ministry, <coughs> Ministry of Planning, came back to the UNDP, every reference to human rights was tracked out. Every single reference. Now, it's not so much the case anymore. So I think we're seeing progress, inching, but we are seeing it. There is still, of course, a very uh, hesitant, they're very hesitant about international scrutiny of their work and of their action. They would like, what they would like to see is this, and this has been also my, my personal experience with them, uh, in dealing with governments in the last number of years is that, you know, in the West they have different priorities for human rights. 
we have our own priorities for human rights. It's no longer we reject human rights, it's we have different priorities for human rights. And we have to do it at our own pace, in our own way, consistently with our own pace of progress. Uh, we had a meeting with King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia, who's the High Commissioner, which we went to in 2010. Now, you know, we were there. And he said, I remember it very, very clearly. He says, we're not against human rights. We are for human rights. But you have to be patient and let us do it our way. And that basically sums it up. I think I'll stop here and, uh, and then we'll just have some discussion. Thank you very much.